Hi folks, Mike Schramke with Larry Stove Sand Equipment. I've got two tractor dealerships in the Nashville, Tennessee area. I sell Coyote tractors, TYM tractors, and Hyundai excavators. I wanted to make a video that kind of make, maybe would help you uh, when, when your tractor, your brand new tractor arrives. Either you went and picked it up or you had it delivered. Hopefully you bought it from me, but maybe you didn't. And uh, either way, congratulations. And it's a, it's a very exciting time. I wanted to call this video, What Now? So the tractor and, and perhaps and probably a bunch of implements are now on your property and you're looking at them and, and, and what now? You know, the natural tendency is to, to jump on, turn the key and off you go. And uh, for some people that have a lot of experience, uh, that's, that's okay. I, I don't want to say it's fine because I still think there's a few things that uh, you should take stock of, take, take inventory of, and, and, and know what you uh, should be expecting and, and what the machine should be expecting of you. If you've, uh, if you've never had a tractor, that really is the time, and, and there can be some anxiety. You're excited, you bought the machine, and, but you spent a lot of money. I mean, none of these are cheap. You, you spent a lot of money. And so, you, you know, what should you know before you really even get started? And I don't expect you to take hours and hours and hours of, uh, of absolute intricate study of the owner's manuals and stuff like that, but I think uh, perhaps I can help you with a brief thumbnail of, of just really before you turn the key, let's just let's just talk about a few things that uh, you know you need to you need to know that you should expect of your tractor, and your tractor should be able to expect of you. So what's what now? Um, the first thing, honestly, and and I'm not that guy that that tells you to read the owner's manual of the. Uh, of the $19 coffee maker that you just bought. You feel free to throw that in the trash or start a, start a bonfire with it, you know, whatever. But it's a little different when you get up, you know, you just spent uh, 20, 30, 50, 60, 70 thousand dollars. And unless you've had the exact model that you have now, the exact model, there are things that are different. And so, yes, I would ask that you, re you refer to the owner's manual. What I did was I brought two tractors in the showroom, and we'll go out there in a second. Um, a Coyote CK2610 in a cab, and a TYM T454 in an open station. I just grabbed two tractors at random. Uh, it doesn't matter what they are. You might have just bought a Deer, Kubota, whatever. But take a second and, um, and look at the owner's manual. And I don't expect you to, to, to study it cover to cover your first time out. There's plenty of safety things, of course, but there's plenty of things that, you know, I guess what I'm saying is you don't know what you don't know. For example, did you know, and this is important, did you know that the Coyote loader on this CK2610 has 18 grease zerts? A zert is a, the little thing that you pump uh, grease into. Just the loader itself has 18 of them. And if you don't know where they are, here's a diagram, if you don't know where they are, you might own this thing and four years later have a, uh, a piece of the structure fail because it was you didn't know where it was. Uh, and so just uh, going through the owner's manual, if you wanted to uh, remove the front end loader, of the uh, of any of them, but in this case the Coyote CK2610. If you refer to the owner's manual, it has just nine simple steps. Because if you're uh, if you're cutting grass or you're doing some uh, maintenance on it, you might find that you and you know you you like it better without the loader. And a lot of people take them on and off, and a lot of people are petrified to ever try it. But I encourage you to try it, and uh, it's easy enough to follow. Um, what oil? does your machine take? Well, I can tell you that uh, if it's a TYM or a Coyote, it went out of here with 15W40 uh, diesel certification, 15W40, 
And uh, what do you do, when, when is the first oil change due, and, and when are the oil changes after that? It's all in the manuals, and it's all easy to find. Uh, the, the people that uh, made these owner's manuals up, it, it's pretty incredible. In fact, on Coyotes, uh, major maintenance items, on the, on the inside flap cover, it tells you that the motor oil and motor oil filter need to be changed at 50 hours. The, now, that's just the first time because it's new. 50 hours the first time, and then after that, uh, most folks do it annually, but it's 250 hours or annually, but uh, things like that. And when you change the oil, are you going to do it? You're going to have us do it or have your dealer do it? It's not complicated, you know, and you might want to look and, and save yourself some money. Uh, but I can tell you that not all oil changes are created equal. The TYM that we're going to look at has uh, an oil pan with one oil plug. The Coyote's oil pan has two. And why is that? It's because it, uh, it's shaped in a way... The bottom of the oil pan has a big upside down arch and then it continues on. Well, what goes through the arch is the front drive shaft. So it has a well here and a well here and they both have oil plugs. If you don't know that, you could, uh, you know, take one of them out and drain half the engine oil out. Um, you'd want to think about your fuel supply. Do you remember these things? Yeah. Yeah, please don't use those. They have, they have no uh, use in, in a modern society. These uh, modern diesel engines have come so far in advancement of uh, ease of operation, ease of starting, fuel economy, everything, everything, everything. There's, uh, and I don't want to go backwards. I, I love the new technologies that make the uh, diesel engines much easier to operate, you know, and much less prone to breakage. But I could tell you that they, you know, a modern diesel engine with its uh, high, high, <laughs> high pressure injectors, they're picky eaters. They won't eat the rust off the bottom of that tank or the, the, the bugs that fell into it or anything else. Your, your fuel needs to be fresh and, uh, and probably hand carried in, uh, you know, five gallon jerry cans that are yellow to signify diesel. But I, I only bring that up because it's my mission in life to rid the world of these, uh, these old rusty drop tanks. What if, you, uh, what, if you, what if your engine, not your engine, what if the tractor blows a fuse? The time to know that is now. Uh, where is the main fuse panel? And what are the main fuses? And should you, should you have a couple of fuses uh, handy? It doesn't happen often. But you know when it's going to happen? It's going to happen when you're showing your, your, your brother who's visiting from Minnesota your brand new tractor and the fuse blows and, and then you have, yeah, uh, know where the fuses are and uh, or know, know where the fuse panel is and what are the main fuses and maybe, you know, maybe throw a couple in the, uh, in the toolbox of the tractor. Um, otherwise, Controls, buttons, switches, warning lamps. It's nice to have a, a knowledge of what all of those things mean. You know, the uh, it's not like if you if you got in a uh, if you got in a new F one fifty, you'll know where the uh, you know if you don't know anything about F one fifties, you could figure out how to start it and put it in gear, and you know where the brakes are and stuff like that. Uh, you could then jump in a Chevrolet Silverado and repeat it and, and you know, go through life just fine like that. But, uh, you know, here, look at this button. On a TYM T454, what is a button that is labeled in the owner's manual, mode sensitivity? Does that mean how sensitive I'm feeling today? Well, no, not really. It, uh, it'll, it, but it's nice to know what that is. And I've had people that uh, have missed out on some really cool features of their tractor that I only find out, you know, later, years later, that they, they didn't know it had. And, uh, and that's kind of a shame. You know, like an automatic PTO, how does that work if, if your tractor has an automatic PTO? And what is that? And it, if, if, you, if you spent the money on a tractor that has that, it'd be nice to know uh, what it is. So let's go out in the showroom. Let me just, and, and here, I, I, here's something. I think there's a few basic items that you need to have 
access to at hand at all times um, besides the keys to the tractor and your, your earbuds, um, you know, that you should have at any given moment because you could need it at any second. So I'm going to show you my kit that I keep and I've got a, uh, I've got a Coyote CK3510 cab and these are some items that I always have right at hand. So we'll start there. Okay, so let me start by just giving you a, a basic inventory of things that you really want to consider to have with you at hand uh, as you start your ownership experience. First thing is a piece of angle iron to prop up the uh, loader because if you, here I'll show you on this one, if you so much as, if you're under the hood checking the oil, do whatever, and somebody walks by, the loader will come down whether it's running or not. If you work with uh, thieves like I do, by all means, put your name on it. This is Mike's, you touch, you die, KL4030. And uh, just putting it in there, if somebody were to bump the loader or something, you know, a, a leak, springs, whatever, the loader won't come down and hurt you. And it really is the only way to, uh, to get under a loader. They do have a, a little switch, a little uh, lockout switch on the joystick itself, but th there's no other way really to do it than that. So that's the first thing I would have. Next thing I would keep is a paint pen, and I use the heck out of these. Uh, the first thing I do on a, uh, if I was buying a tractor, is I'd get a paint pen and I would get all of the dipsticks and uh, one by one I'd pull them out and I would change the color of these from argent silver to white, orange, black, green, doesn't matter. The, the point is clean oil, clean hydro, uh, hydraulic oil, clean uh, front axle lubrication, it's, it, invariably it's clear and it's impossible to see. So uh, do yourself a favor and just do that. I'd, I would then, on, in that same vein, I'd need to know where the fluids go. If, uh, where do I check the motor oil and where do I add the motor oil? Uh, the hydraulic fluid, the front axle, where do I check them? And, uh, you know, how do they look on the dipstick and, and what goes in it? The, for example, let's take the front axle. The Coyote on the uh, front axle calls for either 80-90 gear oil, readily available at any auto parts store, just 90 weight gear oil, or UTF, universal tractor fluid, which is the same stuff that the hydraulic system uses on the tractor. You can use either. TYM calls for uh, 90 weight oil only, so no UTF. So you need to know that and you need to also then have some at hand. Um, you are not required to use manufacturer's branded oil. Now, when your tractor left here, that's what it had in it. It's not required to keep it under warranty. You know, I, I don't want to gouge you on price, even though that we really don't charge any more than anybody else. But this is UTF, universal tractor fluid. Goes here, goes there, goes in anything, any piece of machinery that uses UTF. If you go to a auto parts store, or Walmart, Sam's, whatever, they'll typically have, uh, Tractor Supply is a great example, they'll typically have a, uh, a house brand and then a premium brand. Do, do yourself a favor and buy the good stuff, but uh, you don't necessarily have to buy the manufacturer's brand. Um, you know, we sell it in five gallons, one gallon, and quarts. Uh, motor oil, you know, you might want to have your first 50-hour oil change kit ready so that you can, you know, not waste half of a Saturday scrambling to go find stuff when you need to change your oil. And it's a nice idea to have it at hand. I know, for example, that the three-cylinder engine in this takes two quarts per cylinder, so six quarts of motor oil. So here's a gallon, here's two quarts, there's my six quarts. I'm ready to go with the exception of the oil filter. The oil filter, the hydraulic filter, air filter, any filter on it, here's a, here's a trick that I, I'd like to recommend since you already have your handy dandy paint pen. Record the date and the hours on the filter itself. 
you can easily walk by the tractor and say, yeah, I got about another 75 hours before I have to change the oil. Um, it goes a long way. Also, have a couple of uh, funnels. I know every time I buy a funnel, I always assume the bigger the funnel, the better, and then I, I get there and the, the, the opening's this big and it won't go into anything. Um, so I've got a little sissy funnel, but believe it or not, that's kind of what you need. Um, a, a, a note about maintenance. If you do your own maintenance, which I do not recommend against, I, I, I would appreciate your maintenance business. If, you're, if you choose to do it yourself, no problem. But common sense dictates, you know, uh, uh, studious record keeping. I would, if it were me, and I went to AutoZone and bought a uh, oil filter and motor oil and things like that, an air filter, I would, uh, I would keep those receipts and I would record them in the uh, owner's manual where there's space for it on, uh, on your maintenance log. That way, five years from now, if you had a catastrophic failure of the, uh, oh, I don't know, the, the front axle, you could show that, no, well, here, no, I bought 90 weight oil in June of whatever, and I bought it again in, in July of whatever, and no, I have, re I have been changing the, uh, the front lubrication as per the book. And, and you know what, that ends all arguments right there. Just, you know, makes, makes good sense to do that. If you have your dealer maintain it, obviously you have a computer record and it can be pulled up at any time. If you do it yourself, just keep the uh, paperwork. Um, when I go out, I have, uh, I have several pins of different sizes. Now, this pin came from the back of that tractor. I pulled it off, off the drawbar. But uh, I'll have a couple for three-point implements. I'll certainly have one for a drawbar. You just don't want to get out in the field. You know, you're, you're a half hour from the barn and you realize, you know, you forgot a pin or something. And uh, just, uh, you know, that's a good idea. In the uh, subject of pins, these, if you've never had a tractor, you know, you don't know. These are not bolts and nuts. They, they look a lot like them, but they're not. These are pins, and more specifically, they are shear pins. If you have a uh, implement like my five foot rotary cutter that I own, uh, it does not, my five foot cutter does not have a slip clutch uh, to, if, if, the tra if the cutter uh, tries to engage something horrible and nasty, a huge chunk of uh, iron. Somebody, somebody left an anvil in the field and you hit it, um, they, they, the slip clutch will clutch in and out, you won't even know it happened, and it won't uh, affect the drive line of the implement or the tractor. The other way to protect is uh, shear pins, and this is the way they've done it for a hundred years. If I put this bolt in where it goes, which on a rotary cutter would be um, at one end of the drive shaft, it's simply it's a pin and it goes through and, and then, it, uh, then you connect that to the uh, gearbox housing on the uh, on the implement. I'm making it more complicated than it is. Bottom line, if you hit something nasty, if you hit that anvil, this will break. And uh, two things will happen. You'll say, holy cow, I'm glad that my $3 shear pin broke because it saved my $2,000 cutter. And then you'll say, it'll be like doing the Macarena. That's dating me. I don't have any. And then you'll be tempted to put a pin through it, and then you'll hit that anvil again and destroy your uh, rotary cutter. Carry shear pins. If you have implements that take shear pins, carry shear pins. At hand, and I mean out in the tractor, in the toolbox, or wherever you, you can manage putting it, you'll need two tools at all times. One is this right here. This is a particular type of adjustable wrench. It goes by many names. Uh, to me, it's, it's a spud wrench, S-P-U-D. You can Google it, you can go to Lowe's, Home Depot, they have them. A spud wrench will do all the things that an adjustable wrench will do. It'll tighten your uh, uh, 
lower link arms. It'll, it'll tighten all the stuff that needs to be checked and tightened uh, on a daily basis. But what's different is down here. Uh, here, I've got this, uh, I shot a little 30 second video to show you what this does in helping you when you hook up implements. Okay, thing is we have to get this pin in and line up with those three targets. So, that's where the handy spud wrench comes in. Now you'll need a wrench to do all of your tightening of everything else and everything does need to be tightened. So a, a good adjustable wrench, but if you get a spud wrench, check this out. That is how you line everything up. Last one. That's how it's done. Yeah, that's why you need a spud wrench. And you also need to uh, paint it whatever color you want and put threats on it because once somebody sees how well they work, they'll steal your spud wrench and you will be spudless. The other thing is a, a hammer. Um, kind of short, just, you know, spaces of, of a premium. This is a very particular ham hammer. This is called the BFH. And uh, if you're not familiar with it, this one happens to be a three pounder, a three pound BFH. You could easily uh, go to Lowe's or Home Depot and say, hey, I need a BFH and they will hook you up. But uh, you'll need a hammer when your spud wrench is almost getting the job done, but not quite. So you'll need a BFH. The other thing, and you can't really carry it in the tractor, nor would there be reason to, but invest in a decent quality grease gun. Mine happens to be a Milwaukee because I bought, uh, I've, got a, I've got Milwaukee batteries, and uh, so there was no reason to buy one that I had to start a whole new charger or anything else. Let me recommend against using the old school ones um, for two reasons. One, they suck. Two, because they suck, you'll, you, you'll put off using it. If you get a good quality, it doesn't even have to be a good quality. Whatever brand of batteries you already have for something, get that brand. Whether it's a Makita, DeWalt, uh, Harbor Freight, doesn't matter. Just get a battery powered grease gun. And then spend the money and get a uh, lock and lube. That's the name brand of this thing right here. Now, everybody at one time or another has used a grease gun. You, you, you simply stick it onto the grease zert and you pump, or in this case, you pull the trigger and grease comes out. The difference is, um, modern, uh, modern everything, the, the tolerances are so tight that you can't just sloppily, you know, put it on there. Sometimes if you do and you get it snapped into place, it'll take two men and a boy to pull it off. So what this does, Lock and Lube is the brand, it's got some jaws on it. You push the trigger, it opens it up, and then like this, Okay, it stays on there, it will not come off. I give it about three of those, and then I push and release the trigger. And uh, it's, uh, it's kind of ridiculously priced. I, I believe the lock and lube is, is, you know, it's $27, $28, which makes me think that they probably have a patent for it because I wasn't able to buy an off-brand. Uh, but if somebody stole my lock and lube, I'd buy another one in a heartbeat. I'm not getting paid by them, but I'm telling you, there's nothing nicer with uh, the 50-odd grease certs that these tractors have on them to have a battery-operated grease gun and a uh, lock and lube fitting.
carry some, uh, some decent quality lubrication, something a little heavier than WD-40, something that actually sticks on. This happens to be, uh, I mean, WD-40 spray oil. This is WD-40, but it's a gel lube. When you spray it on something, it sticks, and, uh, and I think that's kind of cool. Um, when it comes to grease, I buy different colors of grease. I don't buy black because uh, as soon as you take the tractor out and use it one time, all your grease certs are black anyway, and you can't tell you know, how much grease just went in it. Um, that happens to be red, and uh, you know, green, purple, blue, doesn't matter, but something other than black, it really helps tell you that you've properly lubed it. When a, when a grease cert someday fails, unscrew it and get a new one. Um, don't, don't abandon that, that particular pivot point because, you know, if the grease cert uh, quit uh, being able to load, it, uh, you know, you, you still need grease. Another thing I would know before I go is um, I would want to know, and I do know, that tractors require an extraordinarily clean uh, the fins of the radiator, the fins in this case of the, uh, the air conditioner thing, um, the hydraulic cooler, the radiator as I said, it's got to be clean and free of debris and free of having any dirt uh, packed in the fins. Unlike a car, these can't go 70 miles an hour to help air cool them. There's no air cooling on these. They, they must be clear of debris and, uh, you know, and they must they must be able to breathe. Um, if, if I hadn't looked at the owner's manual yesterday when I couldn't figure this out, I couldn't figure out how to get the grass screen out. I know it has a grass screen, they all have a grass screen, and that's your first line of defense is grass screen. But I now know that it has two. So I pull this one out and I clean it. And then this one in this case, now they're not all like this, this one slides over and out. And uh, for the life of me, I couldn't figure out, and you see how easy it is, but if you don't know how to do it, you won't be able to do it. Final note on cleaning debris would be this. The, um, even with the clean grass screen and, you know, your, you can use your, your, uh, your gasoline blower to blow out the grass and stuff like that there will still be dirt that got in the fins and through uh, the natural condensation and, and you know, humidity in the air, it'll turn into mud and it'll clog up the fins of your uh, cooling system. Again, in this case, air conditioning, hydraulic and radiator. In that case, uh, hydraulic and radiator. It will, it'll look clean and you'll notice that your, uh, your gauge is hot and you're, you're like, well, my tractor must be broken. No, not necessarily, it, it, they, they don't. Um, you'll need to take a water hose from behind the radiator where the fan is with the engine off and spray water forward and out. And that will clean the mud and debris that gets stuck between the fins. Don't spray this way in, spray inside out and uh, it'll clean the fins up. But you need to know that before you get out there because the first time you cut grass with it, You'll come back and it'll be completely packed with, uh, with debris and it just won't work. It'll overheat. Um, I would also practice, uh, if, I, if I've never had a tractor, I would practice uh, hooking up a three-point implement uh, and, you know, like I just did that little demonstration there, that was simple enough. But uh, the drive shaft itself, to get the feel for how they're, you know, how they attach and to, to know what it feels like when it makes that, that clicking connection, knowing that it's secure in place. Um, I, I, I just would rather do that than when I finally get to the property and I'm ready to do some work. That's not the time to learn. The time to learn is, uh, you know, when you first get the tractor at night or whatever. If you get a, uh, you know, if you get a lamp on the dash that looks like this, it would be helpful to know that uh, that means that there's uh, water in the fuel. Well, there's always water in the fuel. The fuel water separator that separates the water from the fuel has met its capacity and needs to be drained. Um, you'll be out in the field and you won't have your owner's manual. And uh, while it's simple and it takes mere moments to do, 
if you don't know how to drain the uh, accumulated water out, you, you just won't know. It's, uh, that's not the time to learn. The time to learn is ahead of time. On a daily basis, there's, in my opinion, and I think any, any, anybody's opinion, I'm going to get the screw back in if it kills me, I think it's important to, uh, to know what kind of stuff you should check before you go out. You, you know, it, it, I'm not, this isn't a, uh, this isn't a, Airbus 380, there's not a checklist that takes two and a half hours and a co-pilot to go through with you. But there are some things that I would check, and I do check, every time I go out. And uh, another thing you might want to carry is a flashlight. Okay, I got it now. I couldn't see it. Before you start out, you need to uh, check the lower link ends and the three-point arms and the top link these big nuts right here, they loosen, and they loosen all the time. Uh, there's no way to have them not loosen. Uh, the tractor vibrates, the tractor's under tremendous torque, everything else, the implement's under tremendous torque, and they do loosen. So <clears throat> use this end of your spud wrench to tighten those up. What'll happen is uh, those arms will literally uh, work themselves loose and fall off, and you'll run over it with your cutter, and uh, you know, not cool, and easily avoid it. I'd also, uh, unless I specifically cleaned everything up here, I would, uh, I would check it. If I haven't used the tractor in a while, and by a while I mean as little as a couple of weeks, I would uh, check just quickly like that and look for, believe it or not, uh, rodent nests. Some of the most severe damage to a tractor can come from rodent infestation. Uh, for for reasons that are beyond my comprehension, modern companies that make electrical wires, I guess uh, to be kinder to the environment, are, they, they coat them in a, they're insulated in a, uh, in a soy-based product. And apparently, those wires are the most delicious thing in the world to a rat or a squirrel. And uh, they, they, if they chew through them and you go to start your tractor, either it won't start, it'll start and catch fire, it'll start catch fire, ruin the uh, onboard computer, do all kind of nasty things, certainly after you come off of uh, off season, but uh, I would, uh, and I do, check for uh, rodent infestation. I also try to treat the area that my tractor is in for rodents. Um, whether you use uh, chemicals, uh, box traps, whatever you use, um, if left alone, it will, uh, it will be a haven for squirrels, rats, mice, whatever. And uh, we, we often, and not just once in a while, we often have repairs due to uh, uh, chewed wires. It happens regularly. Um, so I would check that. I would, uh, of course, the, the fuel level and uh, using clean fuel that I hand carried. And I would, uh, I'd say about every other time that I use my tractor, I check the, uh, the, the motor oil fluid and the hydraulic fluid. And since you painted it uh, a different color, it's, it's, it's very simple to do. About every time that you change your, your motor oil, um, you know, every, eh, I'd do it more often than that. Let's say twice a year. You need to retorque the lug nuts. And uh, again, tractor, huge amounts of torque. And nuts and bolts of all variety work loose. What we do, and uh, what I recommend you do, is I take that paint pen, after I know these are torqued properly, I draw a straight line on the, uh, on the bolt itself, and then a, a corresponding straight line on both sides of the bolt on the rim. I can walk by this tractor, and if any of that has moved, I'd know it without having to, uh, to actually grab a, a, a torque wrench, and that's part of the daily check. The other thing, <clears throat> excuse me, Tennessee allergies. I, I love Tennessee, but if there's something I could give back, it would be that. Um, the loader is probably under more stress, pressure, flexing, everything than any other component on the tractor. So as far as uh, bolts working loose, it's entirely possible and probable that uh, as you use your tractor and I don't know if it takes a month or takes two years, but uh, those nuts and bolts will work loose. And uh, the, the ones that are bolted to the frame of the tractor, 
again, they need to be torqued and uh, striped. Very important because you don't want the wheel falling off. For one thing, it would be a bad day. For another thing, when it happens, that's the day that your friends, neighbors, distant relatives, and people you went to third grade school with will be at your property and they'll see it. It never happens. Things like that never happen when you're by yourself. I think that if you, in, you know, and I don't want to take any longer, you know, you've been kind enough to stay with me this long. Keep a basic, you know, selection of tools and items that you will need or might need at any given moment. And that would be a spud wrench, a BFH, shear pins, general pins, and uh, some, some fluids uh, that, you know, just keep that stuff at hand and be ready for, for things. When, uh, when a, a fuel, a water and fuel light comes on, you'll say, water and fuel, I'm, I'm ready to go. If a regen light comes on, you'll say, yep, I know how to do that. I read about that. Um, be ready for it. Uh, you know, the time to learn is not when stuff happens. The time to learn is, is ahead of time. Uh, as they say, if, if you fail to plan, you plan to fail. And get yourself a, a good grease gun. The tractors take a tremendous amount of grease, um, and I mean often, not, not in quantity, but uh, the loader, for example, both brands, and I, I guess every other brand on the planet, the loaders are to be lubricated every 10 hours of use, 10 hours. That's not even a half a tank of fuel. And they're not kidding, because um, they, you know, again, they're, they're under tremendous uh, load, tremendous stress. And uh, any of the turnbuckles that, that you have, like uh, telescope, uh, the regular link ends, or the, uh, the screw type that's uh, on the um, top link, anything with threads. Heavy grease is good, uh, so is that gel stuff I showed you. But let's say that you have a box scraper on the, and I know I'm running on. Let's say you've got a box scraper on your tractor and you've used the box scraper now uh, uh, twice a week for a month and you haven't done anything else with the tractor. So you, you're like, ooh, I gotta cut grass. So you take the box scraper off, you put the cutter on and you go to adjust that top link with the screws and you just quickly discover that bare steel uh, corrodes instantly. So um, having, you know, pre-lubricated it with a, with a heavy grease will illuminate that and it'll spin very nicely and you'll be very happy. Anyway, when you get your new tractor, spend a little time learning it, look it over, uh, refer to the, uh, to the manuals, practice and learn how to do things in advance of when they need it. And uh, every question you could have, I, I, I believe this, uh, well, you know, but almost every question you could have is addressed in the, in the books. But you know what to do if you, if you have any struggles at all, uh, uh, figuring something out or having your tractor operate the way it's supposed to or you're doing something wrong. Uh, again, you don't know what you don't know. We are here and uh, if you bought it for me, I won't forget that you, you handed me twenty, thirty, fifty, eighty thousand dollars $80,000. And uh, if you have questions, I'll, I'll get answers for you. You can uh, you could certainly call either store, ask for the service department, parts department, ask for your salesperson. But if you need to jump right to the top of the, uh, to the line, my cell phone is 314-550-3125. And uh, I want this tractor that you purchased for me, that you trusted me with your business, your money, I need it to perform correctly the way I promised it would. So yeah, if you need to jump to the front of the line, 314-550-3125. My name's Mike Schramke, Larry Stovesand Equipment. Thanks and congratulations. <laughs>